Hi, I'm Taylor Rainier, Advertising Account Manager and Social Media Manager with Spinal Column Media Group, and we are here today interviewing a uh, founder and principal attorney from Family and Aging Law Center, Nicole Whip. Welcome. How are you? I am doing well, Taylor. Good. So, um, what do you do with the Family Aging and Law Center? Well, the Family and Aging Law Center, um, as a law firm, what we do is we practice estate planning and elder law. We're solely focused on those two legal issues. Um, my role specifically is I am the leader of the Family and Aging Law Center. I'm the one that founded it. And so I am the person that's primar primarily responsible for the bottom line you know, legal product and the direction of the firm. And that's what we do. Awesome. So who are your clients? So our clients are basically two main groups of people. They are elderly or people that are approaching retirement that want to get their estate plan in order. They've come to a realization that they need to start planning um, for, you know, not if we die, it's not if we're gonna die, we're all gonna die, it's like the when. And so for the most part, most people think, oh, when they start approaching retirement or they're at retirement, that's when they start thinking about it. Um, that being said, it is a much better idea, guys, to do it way sooner than that. But that's definitely one of my main client groups. And then I also, so that's the estate planning side, planning for when we die. Um, and then I have a whole nother part of my law firm, which is more geared toward the elder law side. And the clients in that category tend to be the adult children of aging parents, or, um, you know, it could be a spouse of a person that needs care, or another family member that's responsible for a person that needs care. But Either way, we're always focusing on here's a person that is through either the aging process, just getting older generally, or now there's a crisis, like they've gone to the hospital, and then they get discharged to rehab. And then while in rehab, everybody starts to realize that this individual cannot really go home safely, that if they try to take them home, that it's going to be a disaster. Um, that's, that's the sort of situation that a lot of my clients find in, or they're at home and now we need to start planning for that next phase. So that's the elder law side of what I do. And in that situation, I'm very often dealing with family members and other people that are peripherally involved and not necessarily the individual. That's the, that's the focus of the things. And so we're working on providing care okay. for that person. So of course I'm a law firm. I don't provide actual care to people, but the problem is, and this is one of the biggest issues that everybody faces is that the cost of care is way more expensive than anybody has planned for. And nobody's ready for it. Um, you know, people do not have the right types of financial vehicles in place. And so when they get to a situation where they need care, um, most people just can't afford it or they have sticker shock. They can't believe how much it costs. And then they start panicking and they don't know what to do. And everybody says a bunch of things that are inaccurate. Um, and so they come to us to help them protect their money to make sure that they get the care that they need and to make sure that everything goes smoothly. And so that's all the elder law side of what I do. Okay. So um, as an adult child, you know, if you have, when you have parents that are aging, how do you suggest that they approach their parents and say, hey, maybe it's time to start thinking about all of this? Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that, I think is very important. That's a great question because the problem with estate planning or the problem with planning, this type of planning, is that there's no April 15th, right? Like we have a tax deadline. And so if you have a deadline, you have to meet it and then you do it, right? But nobody wants to do their taxes, but there's a deadline. You've got to get it done. The difference with estate planning and some of the stuff that I do is there's no deadline. And so for that reason, I mean, I have people all the time that say to me, 
I've been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off for 20 years. I've been putting it off, right? The As an adult child, what I see a lot is that adult children start to get really nervous as they see their parents aging because they don't know if their parents have things taken care of. They don't know that even if the parent thinks they have things taken care of, if they actually do. And that is a very legitimate concern because most people do not have things taken care of even when they think they do. And they don't know how to approach it because parents are resistant. So the first thing that I would recommend is if you're the adult child is just recognize that this could be a conversation where you get a lot of resistance, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You should approach it. You should tell them, I'm concerned. I want to make sure that the court doesn't become involved if I need to help you with care. I want to make sure that you can stay in control of your assets as long as possible. I want to make sure that you always get the care that you need. And in order to for me to make sure of those things, mom or dad or both, we need to make sure that your legal situation is set up properly. Can we approach that conversation? And um, you know, and that's really the best way is just telling them, like, I just am worried and I don't want to get into a situation where, you know, we're having to go to court and all these things. Yeah. Um, the problem is, though, Taylor, that a lot of times older people and even younger people, for that matter, have beliefs about what's going to land them in court. that are false. So, like people think, oh, I'm married, for example. So if something happens to me, my spouse can take care of everything. Well, unfortunately, that is completely false. Um, like if you have an IRA, your spouse cannot access your IRA without specific legal authorization. So if you get into a situation where you can't manage that IRA or, they, or you're like having surgery or you have dementia or anything like that, your spouse can't automatically access that money. And then guess what? We have to go to court for the spouse to be able to access the money. And this is stressful, it's time consuming, it's expensive. And that's just one example that I could give you. So don't just assume that your spouse can do everything for you, they can't. You know, there are lots of things that the spouse can't legally do. Your children can't do everything for you. If you are the mother of a child, you can't do everything. Um, there's a lot of legal hurdles that you just need to have things set up properly. Definitely. Um, well, thank you for answering that. That was a fantastic answer. Um, I guess the next, next thing I will ask about is what is a will and what is a trust? Yeah, so one of the problems about wills and trusts is going back to just what we were just talking about is that people think they know things, but they really don't. And so a will is probably the absolute best example of what people don't know. Because the thing about a will, most people believe that if they have a will, that it means, oh, I am going to avoid probate or my family is going to avoid probate. Well, actually, that is completely false. And so I want everybody to hear me. That is completely false. And the reason that it's false is because if you go look up the definition of a will, it will say a document intended for probate. Literally, a will is a document that is intended for the probate process. And so by having a will, it means your family will go to probate. And so for my clients, all of them do not want their family to have to go to probate. So then you just need to realize that a will is not going to be enough. So that's the, the problems with wills. The next thing is, um, what is a trust? Well, trusts are very confusing to people too, because, you know, in like, if we were being literal about what a trust is, it's just a pile of papers, right? It's just a pile of documents. And so like, if I start telling people, we have to fund your trust, we have to put stuff in your trust, that's very confusing to people. People think they mean that if I create a trust for you, I, you know, I'm a lawyer, I create this trust, I create this pile of papers that I have to write out your stuff and put it in the document. And then that means that it's in your document. Well, I could do that, but that doesn't mean that that stuff is actually in the trust. In fact, 
your trust listing things doesn't do anything for you. So the way I explain it to, to people, Taylor, is this, because I feel like I'm actually making it more confusing by what I'm saying. Let me tell you, this is how I explain it to everybody. So if you imagine I'm a child and I'm going to go play at my friend's house and I go and I get, here, I'm going to get some props here. So I go and I get my Barbies and my GI Joes and my stuffed animals, right? And now I'm going to my friend's house to play. I'm walking along and I trip and I fall. Well, I trip and I fall. And then what happens to my stuff? It, it's gone. It goes flying out. Yeah, right? Like I lose control of it. Yeah. And so that situation legally is similar to what would happen if you had no plan or if you have only a will. Because the thing is, is if you have no plan, you do have a plan. It's the state of Michigan's plan. It's the government's plan. Not having a plan does not mean there isn't a plan. There is a plan. It's just the one that the government says you get. And then also um, you, you lose control um, through a will because it goes to probate. That means a judge is in charge, right? That government, the ju a judge is the government, is in charge. So you lose control. So, okay, I don't want to do that. I'm a smart cookie, right? I want and I, I go and I want to get my little red wagon. So, you know, when you're a little kid, you have your little red wagon. Now you take your toys, you put them inside your little red wagon. Now you're going along the street, you're dragging your little red wagon behind you. You trip and you fall. But what happens to the stuff in your wagon? Still safe. Well, it stays there. Yeah. And somebody else can pick up that handle and just keep on walking, or they can hand out your stuff to the people that you say, right? Because it's your wagon, you get to say what happens to the stuff. So in this example, a little red wagon is what we would say is the equivalent of a revocable living trust. Because um, it is, although it's just a pile of paper, like Literally, it's a pile of paper, but the way it works is just like a little red wagon. So I'm going to use, I have this pencil cup on my desk, right? And so if I have a marker, a red marker, and I put it inside this cup, is it still a marker? Yeah. Yeah, right? Like I'm a lawyer, but I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> right? Like this marker is still a marker, regardless of whether or not it's in this cup. And if I have a Barbie and I put it inside a little red wagon, it's still a Barbie, right? Yeah. Yes. Same thing. Your little red wagon, your revocable living trust. If I have my bank account and I put it inside of my revocable living trust, it's still my bank account. Now, this is important because a lot of people believe if they put stuff in their trust that it changes their stuff somehow. But it's and so a lot of people don't want to get a trust for that reason. But it's really important to understand you're a Barbie's a Barbie, a pen's a pen, and your bank account is your bank account. Your mutual fund is your mutual fund. Your stocks are your stocks. Your house is your house. By putting it inside your trust, it doesn't change the nature of the thing. All it does is allow your stuff to be transported across the line of disability or death and avoid probate, which then what that does is it just does what you thought the will was going to do, but actually doesn't. And so that's the purpose of a revocable living trust. And so even though it seems weird if you think about it as a pile of paper. If you think about it literally like it's a little red wagon, then it makes a lot more sense. And then it's not so intimidating, right? And that's how I want everybody to think about a revocable living trust. But let's be clear. There's a problem with this little red wagon. What is the problem? So a revocable living trust is mostly an estate planning thing. We're planning for what happens when we die and also in some level, what happens if we go, if we, because tripping and falling can be, I become too sick or disabled to manage my stuff. And it can also mean I've died, I died. But, and so it's a good um, tool for managing those situations. But the problem is here I am, I'm going to my friend's house, got my little red wagon behind me. And now that bully down the road comes and knocks me down and starts grabbing stuff out of my little red wagon. It's not far-fetched, right? I mean, yeah. we can all imagine that this happens. And so it also happens legally because the bullies of the world are, for my clients, lawsuits and the nursing home, care costs. And so if 
you have a revocable living trust, it's an open vessel, just like this cup. I mean, if you were sitting across from me in my desk, you could reach in and take stuff out of this cup. We would both agree it's my cup, but if you wanted, you could. And if I didn't want you to have it, we could fight, but you're young, I'm tough, but who knows what's gonna happen, right? And so we, if you don't want somebody to be able to reach in and take your stuff because it's an open vessel, it's just important for people to realize that a revocable living trust isn't going to cut it. And so this is one of also, so I, this whole idea of putting stuff in your trust is a huge myth. It's what people think they know, but don't. Also this idea that people will say to me, oh, I have a trust. I'm protected. They say it to me all the time. And I always say, well, what do you think you're protected from? You know, you have a revocable trust. What are you protected from? And the reality is, is most people just can't answer that question, Taylor, because they don't know. They don't understand how their trust works. And so I want to make sure that everybody understands this revocable trust. It protects you from probate, which is great, but it doesn't protect you from the bullies of the world, which for my clients is things like lawsuits, but really more importantly, the nursing home. And so if you want to do that, then we create in my office something that's more like a safe and now you put your stuff inside, you shut that door, and only you have the ability to open up the door and hand out the things to the people that you say, but they can't get inside. And we call that an asset protection trust. It's a different thing than a revocable living trust. And so um, it's just really important for people to understand that there's all these myths that are going out there and like people have ideas about these things. But just like anything else in this world, you don't know what you don't know. And if you make decisions based on things that you don't really understand, they could be wrong decisions based on what you're really trying to accomplish. And so we want to make sure that people understand what they're choosing. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I love that analogy of the, the little red wagon. That's, that's awesome. It's memorable. Um, right now, you're never going to forget it. Nope. <laughs> um, my next question, and we talked about this, you know, when we originally started talking, um, why are online documents dangerous? You know, I think some people would think that I'm saying, oh, don't go do online documents because, you know, I'm not a lawyer that does online documents. And so you're like, oh, you're just a lawyer. You want the money, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, you know, I deal with people that, that think this way and I understand it. I, I might be skeptical too, but, and, and unfortunately there are some people out there that seem to be pretty reputable that give and have these online document packages and stuff. And it drives me insane, Taylor, because they are not lawyers. So that's first and foremost to understand like your financial planner that has their online document or some financial guru out there that has their online document package. They're not a lawyer. And, and that's terrible. And secondly, they aren't thinking the way that I would think. And third, those are cookie cutter documents. And the reality is most people will come into my office thinking they want this cookie cutter result. But when I talk to them about what they're really trying to accomplish, 99 times out of 100, they don't want a cookie cutter result, but they didn't even know what they could do. And with an online document, nobody's advising you about what you really can do to accomplish the things that you're really trying to accomplish. And if you're the kind of person that's watching this video, I promise you, you want to accomplish things that you may not even be thinking about, but you just don't even know that it's available to you. And so they're, the online documents are dangerous from that perspective, but they're also dangerous in because they have to be very generic, right, to um, be applicable to most people. And they are all geared toward estate planning issues, which means they're not geared to, toward elder law issues. And the thing about it is people's greatest threat to their lifetime financial security today is the cost of care, the cost of long-term care in the future, health care. And Medicare does not cover everything, not by a long shot. And so when you end up getting faced with like many of my clients, 10, 12, $14,000 a month bills for care. And I'm not even exaggerating. This is not an exaggeration. This is real. Then what your cookie cutter document isn't going to cut it. It is not going to cut it. And so 
Um, you know, and it doesn't matter. You don't have to be rich. In fact, this is the other thing. People always think, oh, I can't do this stuff. I have to be rich to do it. No, 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 kids. The less money you have, the more you need to protect it, right? Like rich people can afford to pay for long-term care. If you're not rich, you can't afford to pay for it. And you can't afford to mess around trying to figure it out when you're in crisis. Like you need to take care of things. And so online documents are so dangerous to people because they don't tell you, they don't help you with these things. They don't help you think about what are the choices that you may have to protect yourself and protect your money and make sure that you don't run out of money before you die. They're not going to do that. And I know because I've been doing this work for a long time, that most of you are worried about that, or you're worried about it for your parents. You might be worried about it for yourself. You don't want to leave your spouse in poverty. You know, these are things that all families are worried about. But that's why even just consulting with a good elder law attorney, not some garden variety estate planning attorney, but a good elder law attorney is going to make a huge difference to you to be able to have some peace of mind around these topics. That makes sense. Thank you for yeah, answering it's that. It's unfortunate. There's too much information out in the world right now around these things, but most of it isn't good information. And so what it does is it gets people confused and then people make a lot of, you know, just unfortunate mistakes that cost them a lot more anxiety and money in the end. And it's just worth it even just to have a consultation and know what your options are for most people. You don't have to do all the things, but you at least can know what your options are. Definitely. So how can people reach out to you? How could they, you know, if they're interested in going through these steps, what's the what's the first step? Well, definitely the best thing that anybody can ever do is just call my law firm. Um, the, the number is 248-278-1511. My staff is awesome. Um, you can talk to any person that answers the phone here. They're going to get you right into our process um, of explaining what your options are, understanding how what your goals are, making sure that you um, and your people that you care about are taken care of and with all these things. So literally just calling the office, getting a really nice, um, helpful person on the other end of the line, and they'll just lead you through everything. And one of the things that we really pride ourselves on at this law firm is that we really strive to make things easier on our clients. We do the hard work. You just have to um, be willing to go along with the process. And, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of clients, happy clients later, we know that the process works. So it's as easy as that. Just picking up the phone, giving us a call, and we'll take care of you. Sweet. I can vouch for that. Every time I call in, whoever I speak with is super nice. So um, definitely... Yay. <laughs> they better be. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, uh, you know, give her office a call if you're interested in um, planning your future. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Nicole. Is there anything else you would like the viewers to know? Well, you know, we live in a world right now of this kind of online and um, social media and things like that. And I just want to make sure everybody understands like, yeah, we're on social media and I know Taylor is going to give you guys the links for all our different things, but um, you know, but, but we are a law firm. And so we don't give legal advice over social media. We aren't doing any of those things. Um, really the only way to get legal advice from us and from any good reputable attorney is by actually, you know, calling the firm. So just be aware of that. You know, it's really important that we engage in a human to human basis. But, you know, yeah, follow us. I We love to, um, you know, give information. I have tons of videos up. There's so many places that you can get knowledge directly from this horse's mouth um, on our website, on my podcast, on YouTube, on, you know, LinkedIn, on Facebook, like there's so many places that you can get a lot of information before you even talk to us that it's worth it to explore those things. But just realize we're not giving advice over the internet, you know, on social media. So th th that's why you'd want to make that phone call. So thank you so much, Taylor. You're welcome. Thank you again. I'll make sure to include all those links. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. You Bye. too.